All right, here's part two on our study of the heresy of Calvinism. Calvinism proves <laughs> sinful intelligence. So how does that happen? Well, we're going to look at what they have to say. The most popular quote of Calvinist, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. If you read anything that Calvinists have written or you hear them talk or listen to a sermon that's about their doctrine, you're going to hear them say, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And then you'll hear a lot of discourse on why we cannot choose. Here's what John Calvin said. You've not chosen me. He declares still more clearly that it must not be ascribed to their own merit, but to his grace that they have arrived at so great an honor. So Calvinism found that to be a popular phrase as well. And here's another one by Spencer. The bluntest affirmation that man does not do the choosing of God since his depraved nature is capable of being positive only toward Satan is that of Jesus. So the words of Jesus, he says, proves that we cannot be positive toward God. A sinner cannot be positive toward God. That is, he cannot decide that he wants God. He cannot choose God. He cannot believe toward God. A sinner is in a state of bondage with a will that cannot choose rightly, only can choose wrongly. That's what a Calvinist teaches. I'm not exaggerating there in any measure whatsoever. Christ's negative remark is just a forceful way of saying, about negative mark, he talks about, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. It's just a forceful way of saying that although a Christian may think that he is the decisive factor in choosing Christ, the truth is that ultimately it is Christ who chose the believer. It is Christ who chose the believer. And then after that, the believer chose Christ. That's by Palmer in Five Points of Calvinism. Now, the Calvinist teaches that no one decides to become a Christian, desires to be a Christian, desires to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, thinks positively about God in Christ, unless he's first regenerated. That is, a sinner is going along, minding his own business, enjoying his sin, rebelling against God. And the time and the hour and the day and the moment come that God decided in eternity that he's going to turn a screw and make that person become a believer. So God comes down and turns that little invisible screw that's in their nature somewhere. And when he does, they suddenly desire God. And they suddenly believe the gospel they're hearing. And then, upon believing, they have faith and they're born again. But all that takes place before they choose to believe. The, 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 the believing, uh, the, <laughs> the, the regeneration takes face, place before the believing, before the positive response. Now, I'm not exaggerating. You go back and ask any Calvinist, they'll tell you that's true. Uh, that is an, a learned Calvinist. Most people who are Calvinists don't know what they believe, and that's good. Uh, but doesn't the Bible say that Christ chose us, not we him? What does it say? The word chosen is used by John. That's where it's found, John 15, 16. Uh, it's used just five times in the whole book, and that's the only place that you'll find the Calvinist referring to, with the exception of possible three others, which we'll deal with later. So five times in four passages, three times other than John 1, 15, 6, are subject at hand. Now, verses the Calvinists use to support their heresy. This is it, John 15, 16. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. See, see what it says? That means that we have not chosen God, he chose us. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of my Father in my name, he'll give it you. Now, this is part of a long discourse that Jesus gives about 12 hours before his crucifixion. The disciples are getting their farewell address from Jesus. Starting in chapter 13, he goes through 17. And he gives this careful message about what they can expect and what's going to happen to them. 
And he reminds them that they're going to be rejected, persecuted, and even killed. And he says, now remember something. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Now, what does he mean by I chose you? He said, I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. He chose them to be his disciples. He chose them to go out into the world and bring forth fruit. Their fruit should remain. Now you say, well, that's just your interpretation that he chose them to be his disciples, that this, that this is what it's all about. <laughs> the Calvinists actually sometimes admit that that's what it's all about. Quite often you will read a Calvinist who will who'll, who'll agree exactly with my interpretation of this passage, more times than not, actually. Now let's look at the five times the word chosen is used by John so you can get an idea of what he's saying. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve? See, see, now he's talking about the twelve, chose the twelve, and one of you is a devil. So we now have a passage of scripture where one has been chosen, and he turns out to be a devil. He goes to hell. He's speaking of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray, being one of the twelve. So that's the first mention of it there in John. So apparently being chosen is not identical with being elected and foreordained to eternal life, not the way Jesus uses it. It's the disciples that he chose, no one else. I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen. Okay, there we have again a second usage of chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. That's a quote of Judas Iscariot, again, one of the chosen, betraying Jesus. He said, I know whom, I know I chose <laughs> a child of the devil. I know that. In John 15, 18, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So this is that discourse. He's preparing them for the rejection they'll experience. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So he's talking to the twelve only. And he says to them, the world's going to hate you. You're going to go forth, take this message, and you're going to be rejected. Why? Because it hated me first. So when you bring that message, they're going to hate you as well. Because I chose you out of the world. So this is not about them being chosen from before the foundation of the world for salvation. There are other passages where you might make that point more effectively. Not here, not at all. That's the third time. Now, the fourth and fifth time, and that's the only time it's used by John, is back to our verse. John 15, 16, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth free. He's talking to the 12, has been all the way through. Only about the disciples is he chosen. He never says anywhere in the scriptures across the board that believers individually were chosen for eternal life, chosen and ordained to eternal Never says that. So you can just take this verse and set it aside. Next time a Calvinist uses it, know that he is either ignorant, uh, deceived, or he's trying to deceive you. Quite often they'll admit the exact interpretation I've given you, but then go on and say, oh yes, this passage is about him choosing them as his ministers to take the gospel, but it is an indication that God always does the choosing, not us, so therefore he chose us to salvation. Big, big leap. Jesus chose Matthew. You remember that? He said, I chose you. Remember when he went by and he said to Matthew, come follow me? That's when he chose him. Remember when Jesus went up to the disciples, Peter and Andrew fishing, and said, come, follow me? So we have in the Bible these examples of Jesus choosing the apostles to go and bring forth fruit. That's just one of about ten key passages that the misguided Calvinist, you know, I feel dumb answering this. This is like... Answer not a fool, lest thou be a fool. If this were not 500 years of ingrained stupidity and it was invented today, 
no one would be deceived by it. It'd be so ridiculous, so offensive, and so unbiblical that no one would fall for it. But it's been the, the lie has been perpetrated like they do in politics and the media so long that people have come to accept it without examining it closely. So I'm going to stop there. 